please welcome Principal Scientist and Research Director for the Center on Knowledge Graphs at the USC Information Sciences Institute, Dr. Pedro Zacchelli. Good afternoon. My name is Pedro Zacchelli. I'm a professor at USC. And I'm going to talk to you about advances in natural language understanding. So natural language understanding technology is premature today. I can ask my watch, who is James Rodriguez, and it will tell me he plays for Bayern Munich. I can also ask much more complicated questions. For example, who was president when President George W. Bush was born? And it will tell me it was Harry Truman. Yeah, I find this pretty amazing, actually. So what I'm going to do today is tell you a little bit of history of how we got here, give you an overview of the technologies and the research topics that uh, are hot today. So let's start with the history of speech understanding. So this chart shows uh, key milestones in the history of speech understanding. I color coded it so that the DARPA investments are in blue. We've been working in speech understanding for almost 50 years. You know, in 1972, we had a system that could understand one sentence. You know, in 1973, we were able to do continuous speech. In 1988, we had a speaker-independent system that could handle almost 1,000 words. And five years later, we were up to 20,000 words. In 2013, SRI developed Siri. It could handle almost an unlimited vocabulary. Siri Inc. launched a few years later. Apple bought it. And we have Siri on our phone and our watch. But DARPA continued investment in speech. In 2011, the DARPA Bold program looked at the problem of doing speech-to-speech -speech translation on devices that were not connected to the cloud. So let me give you a high-level idea of how natural language understanding technologies work. The first step is to construct a computer representation of the input. The input can be speech, short documents, or long documents. The second step uses knowledge about the world to create a response, like telling me that James Rodriguez plays for Bayern Munich, or take an action, like uh, you know, booking me a ride to the airport. I want to emphasize the knowledge part, because this is the part of the system where the smarts are. And building knowledge bases is very, very hard. It's also an opportunity for natural language understanding technology, because most of human knowledge is still in documents. So let's talk about knowledge representation. Knowledge graphs are networks of entities and relations. We use nodes to represent entities, and we use the edges to represent relationships between them. So here we have a node for Harry Truman, one for the presidency of the United States, and an edge that tells us that Harry Truman held the position of president from 1945 to 1953. Now, here's a chart of milestones in knowledge representation. Again, DARPA funded foundational work in knowledge representation, focusing mostly on systems that use formal logic to represent knowledge. The DAML program is very significant as it funded the work that led to many of the standards that are in use today. In the early 2000s, the technology matured. We got knowledge of graphs like DBpedia that represent the knowledge in Wikipedia pages. Also, Freebase was created, a very large crowdsourced effort, created a large knowledge graph which Google bought and used 
to sort of create its own knowledge graph. Recently, the private sector has been adopting knowledge graphs as they view them as a competitive advantage. And DARPA has continued to invest in knowledge graphs, particularly in representation of events and extracting knowledge from documents. So let me review one second the connection between natural language understanding and knowledge graphs. So we go back to our Bush question. What the system has to do here is it somehow has to map the words in the question to a very small subgraph in a potentially very large knowledge graph. And if you look here, the trick is somehow it has to figure out this position held edge, even though these words position held do not appear in the question at all. Here, we see a knowledge graph created in the DEFT program. It has up-to-date information on people and organizations who, for the most part, you know, don't have Wikipedia pages. It used news stories and natural language understanding technology to extract all the information and create this knowledge graph. So, the tradition in knowledge graphs has been based on formal logic to represent knowledge. One of the key breakthroughs recently is the idea of representing knowledge using vectors. So if I tell you, you know, what words fill in the blank, you'll probably think of words like this ones. But I bet you didn't think of words like this ones. Now, we can formalize this idea using vectors of numbers. So let's think about the following. Suppose I take every word in the English dictionary and I create a vector of numbers for it, like so. I'm going to need a lot of vectors because I have a lot of words. And say these vectors have 300 dimensions. So I'm going to need to come up with 30 million numbers to fill these vectors. Surely, the numbers that I put in there must matter. So how do I go about doing that? So let's look at this sentence, and let's focus on the word president. Suppose I had assigned all my vectors with random numbers. And now I take the words next to president, and I take their vectors, and I try to predict the vector for president using some function f. And then I measure the error of the prediction with respect to the vector that I had there. There's going to be some error. And you know, mathematicians figured out an optimization technique to reduce the error. So I can adjust the numbers of the vectors to reduce the error. And then I slide over one word to the right, and I do the same thing. I try to predict the vector. I tweak the vectors to reduce the error. And I do this millions and millions of times on lots and lots of sentences. And so I keep doing it, and then something magic happens. If I plot the resulting vectors in two dimensions, which I can do with a sort of clever mathematical trick, what I see is that words with similar meanings are so sort of close to each other. What's more, now I can compute the semantic similarity of words using simple you know, math, cosine. So if I have two words like elephant and tiger, and I want to know how similar they are, I compute the cosine. So if you're a geek like me, I mean, this is just mind boggling. You, know, you give me two words, I give you back a number that measures the semantic similarity. But you know, that's not all. I mean, suppose you have the vector for king, and I subtract the vector for man. What I'm going to be left with is a vector that represents of the royaltiness of being king. And then I can add the vector for woman, and I get the vector for queen. Now, I mean, this is super cool. 
This really tells me that these vectors encode something quite fundamental about the meaning of the words so that I can do this math. And you know, this idea is so powerful that people have worked on it and created things like multilingual word embeddings you know, from parallel corpora. So here you see the word for money and the German word for money, Geld. They have almost identical vectors. So I can use this for all kinds of multilingual tasks like translation. And then people figured out how to do this with graphs too. So I can take the nodes and the edges in a graph and convert them to vectors. And then I can do graph operations like minimum path by just taking the cosine of the nodes and I can do community detection by detecting clusters. And what's, what's really cool is that now I have converted you know, the symbolic knowledge graphs and words into the same framework of vectors. And you know, today, every, knowledge, every natural language understanding system uses this ability. The, the thing that they do, they take the input documents and create vectors. You can take the knowledge graph, create vectors. You feed this to a combination of a deep neural net and conventional AI, and this is how we get responses from Siri and so on, and also how we build knowledge graphs when we are processing text. So today, the technology is usable when the documents are well-formed, where we're interested in things, uh, when the documents are in English, and when we're processing text or speech. The research is focusing on you know, handling informal languages, knowing what happened in addition to just the things, events, you know, small, low resource languages and handling multimedia documents. So I'm gonna talk about two projects uh, where you know, highlight this research aspects of the technology. So here are two documents. And suppose I run them through my so, traditional, conventional natural language understanding technology, and I ask you to look at the knowledge graph and tell me what these documents are about. So you'll say, well, you know, it's about Sonny Corleone and his son Vito and some Bruno Tataglia guy who's a gangster. And you know, there's nothing there about the most important thing, which is that Sony killed Bruno. You know, the knowledge graph doesn't have that information, so you can have a system that could answer questions about it. So the idea in Deft was to actually extract this information from the documents and create these event nodes that tell me that there was this event and the actor was Sony and the victim was Bruno, and now I can build a system that can answer questions about so who killed Bruno or what did Sony do? So the next project is the AIDA project, and it's uh, focused on handling documents that have multimedia. So let me start with an example. This phrase, I can see a tank from my house. These are all possible tanks that I could see from my house. Some are more likely, but all are actually possible. Now, if you gave this to a system, it wouldn't know what node to create in the knowledge graph because they are all possible. So if I feed this image to my state-of-the-art object recognition system, it'll pick up the church and the apartment, but it might tell me that you know, there's a tank and a road, or it might be slightly confused and think that there's a boat and a river. And again, it doesn't know what to put in the knowledge graph. But if I have the two documents together, the ambiguity goes away. We're talking about a military tank. So this is of the, the insight that AIDA is exploiting. And so it's to increase accuracy of multimedia, multimedia extraction and also handle the problem that there might be multiple hypotheses that are being exposed in these documents that are being recorded 
in the knowledge graph, and we want to bring them out to the users. So here's our document. So in AIDA, you know, it sees the document with the you know, tank. It doesn't know it's a tank or a boat, so it puts both in the knowledge graph. But then, you know, together with this image came a tweet with text. There's a scary Russian tank in front of my house. So now the system can eliminate the incorrect you know, boat hypothesis from the graph, and you know, it adds the person who sort of has bad sentiment toward this tank. Then comes another tweet with another image and text. They are definitely Russian T-72 tanks. Okay, so you know, the system adds the T-72 and affiliation uh, Russia. So now we're building this knowledge graph. You know, maybe we have two tanks running around. One is Russian, the other one we don't know. Then you know, this tweet in Russian comes in and it says, oh, this is clearly a T-64 battle tank because you know, the Russians don't use them anymore. Okay, so we know, okay, the T-64 is not affiliated with Russia. So now we have this, all this information from which we can actually extract two fairly clean hypotheses. One is that you know, there is a tank running around and it's not Russian. And the other one is that you know, there is a tank running around and it's Russian. You know, this is important because you know, as these events are unfolding very rapidly, you want to understand what are the possibilities of what's going on in the ground based on what you're seeing in your documents. So, in conclusion, this is where we are. You know, the usable technology uses mostly crowdsourcing to build the knowledge graphs. And these knowledge graphs are about entities and relations. And we use the natural language understanding technology to answer questions, you know, like in Siri and so on. Current research is really going well beyond that. We're, hand, we're trying to handle multimedia doc documents. We're trying to eliminate the crowdsourcing because crowdsourcing is so expensive and it doesn't scale if we want to build knowledge graphs about many, many things. And in our knowledge graphs, we don't want just entities and relations. We want information about the events that are happening in the world. So we want entities, relations, plus events. And we want to go well beyond question answering. And I gave you some examples. You know, the depth, uh, your relationship diagrams of the people and the organizations that you could extract from documents is one example. Uh, you know, we could use all the extraction from events to build maps of hotspots in the world. We can use this for machine translation. Uh, I showed you the AIDA example of hypothesis options. I can sort of create multiple hypotheses about what may be happening in the world done by a system that is of reading the documents. And then based on all this information in the knowledge graph, I could try to predict what events may unfold in the future. And this is something that uh, you know, the new Kairos program is uh, looking at. So, I'm done. <laughs> oh, okay. So here's an interesting question. What makes this seemingly simple tasks so difficult for AI? So I think one of the so very difficult things for AI is common sense reasoning. So you know, if you read a phrase, you know, Pedro was sweating uh, before giving his talk, uh, you know why. A machine may think that you know, I went exercising or something like that. You know, machines have no common sense. And so this makes it very difficult for them to understand even very simple sentences that everybody knows. And you know, this is an active area of research. There's a new DARPA program on common sense reasoning. 
And uh, you know, this is one of the things that currently you know, works very poorly. Uh, the knowledge graphs have a lot of facts in them, uh, but they don't have common sense. Haven't Google it all already, already solved these problems? <laughs> I, I, I like this question. Uh, and and you know, I, I, I sort of have different points of view here. So, I mean, Google's doing a lot of things. Uh, but, you know, when I sort of researched this talk, I realized a lot of what Google does was actually, is actually being done by people who actually worked on DARPA programs and then went to Google. <laughs> or students who sort of graduated and went to Google. So yeah, Google does a lot of things. Uh, and it makes them work really fast and on really big data sets. But I don't know if uh, you know, some of the problems that we're looking at, they're also interested in. Uh, some of them may sort of fit in verticals, and you know, I, you know, I, I never know what Google is really interested in. So I, I think you know, they're not actually solving all the problems that we are tackling. They're sort of making them into sort of a commodity that everybody uses after I think the community sort of, for the most part, figures out how to actually do it. Not to say that they don't have good scientists, but you know, many of them actually are people who so we work with on some projects. Uh, final question, okay. What would you consider the greatest recent successes in this area of research? So to me, the idea of vectors is just an enormous breakthrough. Uh, the idea that I can compute vectors for words is a bit older. That, you know, now that I can compute vectors for knowledge graphs, I mean, th this is you know, really amazing. Because your language is kind of fuzzy and nuanced. And our old knowledge graphs were sort of logic-based, zero, one. And they, I mean, they, we always struggled with this idea that you know, there were all kinds of exceptions and so on. Now with vectors, and you know, so sort of just think cosine, you know, gives me a real number. I can sort of do this reasoning that is much more fuzzy and combined with language. And I think we're starting to see how people are leveraging this uh, for a lot of tasks in sort of natural language understanding and sort of building knowledge graphs automatically. So, I mean, I think this is just getting started and I th think we're gonna see a lot of breakthroughs that come from sort of this marriage of these two ideas of knowledge graphs and vectors and sort of analyzing language. That's all the questions. Thank you.